Section 2 of The Art of Music, Volume 1, The Pre-Classic Periods. Editor-in-Chief, Daniel Gregory Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jake Militia. Chapter 1. Primitive Music. Music is coeval with the human race. In all probability, it precedes spoken language. For music is primarily the expression of emotion. Articulate language is the expression of definite thought. And in the process of evolution, emotion precedes thought. The beginnings of music are to be found in nature herself. The howling of the winds, the humming of insects, the cries of animals, the songs of birds must all be considered as elemental music inasmuch as they contain the two fundamental elements thereof, rhythm and tone. Rhythm is the more or less regular division of time by beats or strokes. The heart beats in a regular rhythm. There is the rhythm of the raindrops. Man walks with a rhythmic stride. The waves beat upon the shore in a solemn and impressive rhythm. The drumming of the partridge, the chirping of the crickets, the tapping of the woodpecker, the muttering of distant thunder, etc. All these are rhythms, more or less regular divisions of time, marked off by beats or accents. Now tone is merely a noise which persists at a certain pitch. When we cry out in fear, we usually produce a noise, but should we be careful to maintain a steady and equal emission of breath, we should produce a tone. In other words, a noise is produced by a rapid and irregular change in the rate of vibration of the sounding body, whereas a tone is produced by the steady maintenance of a certain rate of vibration for a long enough time for the ear to appreciate its definiteness. That this time need not be very long is proved by the ease with which we grasp as tones certain very short notes used in music, grace notes, for example. Many noises, in fact, upon analysis, appear to be collections of heterogeneous tonal fragments which succeed each other with such rapidity and eccentricity as to preclude the recognition of their tonal elements as such. Such animal cries as the roaring of lions, the baying of wolves, the screeching of parrots, or the barking of dogs must be classed as mere noises. While they are frequently of rhythmic interest, they contain too little of the tonal element to be regarded musically. On the other hand, the humming of certain insects, which produces a definite tone, the whistling and singing of many birds, the musical cries of certain monkeys, as related in Darwin, and even on occasion the crying of the wind, must all be regarded as natural music. The wind, with its fitful and irregular howling, usually produces mere noise. But there are times when it blows with such a steady intensity through the forest that a definite tone is produced. One reads with interest and sympathy in the memoirs of a certain naturalist how he, while listening to the ethereal singing noises produced by myriads of small insects, imagined that he caught but the lower notes of some elfin symphony too refined for mortal ears to hear. The songs of the singing birds are very notable examples of natural music, for here the tones are in many instances quite perfect, while the rhythms of many bird songs are sharply defined and easily noted. But it is savage or primitive man who claims our greatest interest. Untouched by learning, simple of mind, and direct and naive in his conduct, he is at the same time a part of nature and the ancestor of civilised man, a being not only endowed with strong rhythmic sense, but with vocal powers far superior in possible variety of inflection to those of any of the animals. His love cries, war songs, and savage laments are as much natural music as are the songs of birds or the cries of animals, and contain, even though crudely, the elements from which civilised music has subsequently been developed. It is with him that our story really begins. Thus we see 
that the fundamental elements of music are to be found in nature herself. Man, in his upward and wonderful course from barbarism to civilization, has but cunningly combined these elements with ever-increasing intellectuality, until there has come to development the glorious art of music as we know it today, an art which hath the power of making heaven descend upon earth, as it is written in the Chinese annals. When we contemplate the life of the savage, we are to all intents and purposes observing the lives of our own primitive ancestors. As we see them today, they without doubt portray for us a phase through which we ourselves passed on our way upward to civilization. No tribe of savages has yet been discovered who have not possessed some elemental fragments of music. No matter how barbaric the people, how rude their manners, or how savage their dispositions, music of some sort plays a vital and significant part in their lives. Most savage tribes have their war cries, songs and dances, their playful or ceremonious dances, their love or marriage songs, their funeral songs, and lastly, their mysterious and pantheistically religious incantations, prayer songs, appeals to unseen powers, either diabolical or beneficent. To effect the deliverance of some person from a dread disease, or to bring rain or abundance of game, etc. All these are to be regarded as primitive music, music which has hardly as yet attained the dignity of an art. The collection and study of these fragments has been of great interest to ethnologists and philosophers, and has given rise to numerous theories regarding the origin of music. Herbert Spencer gives a physiological explanation of its origin, claiming that intense emotion acts in a particular manner on the vocal and respiratory organs, thereby causing the person thus affected to emit sounds, either high or low, loud or soft, according to the kind of emotion with which he is filled. Beginning with the proposition that all music is originally vocal, he goes on to say, All vocal sounds are reproduced by the agency of certain muscles. These muscles, in common with those of the body at large, are excited to contraction by pleasurable and painful feelings. And again, we have here, then, a principle underlying all vocal phenomena, including those of vocal music, and by consequence those of music in general. The muscles that move the chest, larynx, and vocal cords, contracting like other muscles in proportion to the intensity of the feelings, every different contraction of these muscles involving, as it does, a different adjustment of the vocal organs, every different adjustment of the vocal organs causing a change in the sound emitted. It follows that variations of voice are the physiological results of variations of feeling. Charles Darwin attempts to explain the existence of primitive music by considering it as a secondary sexual manifestation. He asserts that primitive song was used as a method of charming the opposite sex, that the first songs were love songs, and that from all these all others were developed. In The Descent of Man, he says... The male alone of the tortoise utters a noise, and this only during the season of love. Male alligators roar or bellow during the same season. Everyone knows how much birds use their vocal organs as a means of courtship, and some species likewise perform what may be called instrumental music. And later, women are thought to possess sweeter voices than men, and so far as this serves as any guide, we may infer that they first acquired musical powers in order to attract the other sex. Spencer's explanation is pure theory, based as it is not upon observation of particular facts, but upon a knowledge of certain physiological laws. Darwin's explanation, on the contrary, is evidently based on very careful observations of particular instances of the manifestation of the primitive musical faculty. Nevertheless, However interestingly Darwin writes concerning the origin of music, Spencer's explanation must seem to us the broader, more inclusive and satisfying of the two, inasmuch as it bases the origin of music in a variety of emotional experiences rather than in only one, the love emotion. Darwin, however, says that the emotion of love may give rise to many other emotions of a quite different character, such as rage, jealousy and triumph, and proceeds to indicate the possible development of various kinds of primitive songs from primitive love songs. 
It is, however, difficult for us to conceive of the development of war songs, incantations, or howls of grief for the dead as having been developed from primitive love songs. According to Grosser, music arose from the play instinct. It is one of the forms in which superabundant energy is spent. Most animals, including man, are endowed with more than enough energy than is absolutely necessary to supply their physical needs. This superabundant energy is expressed in different kinds of play. The leaping and diving of the porpoise, the gambling of dogs, the running of races, and the playing of games among primitive men are examples of the working of the play instinct. Our modern sports, tennis, football, etc., are also examples of it. According to this theory, singing and dancing first arose as a means of diversion from the monotony of existence, as a means of whiling away the time and making life pleasant. This is a most important theory, and while it probably is not wholly true, it contains a large percentage of truth. It is upheld by a great number of writers besides Grosser, and has significance concerning the origin of all the arts, including music. Another theory on the origin of music is that it arose through the imitation by primitive man of bird songs and other sounds in nature. It is true that in a collection of the music of many savage tribes, there are numerous songs which are certainly imitations of certain bird calls and other animal cries. Particularly are these to be noted in the music of the North American Indians. They have pelican, crane, elk, and buffalo songs, and even songs imitating the wind in the pines. Their animal songs are to a large extent but slight developments of the cry of the animal himself. This cry was probably first used by the primitive hunter as a decoy, and eventually through the frequent use became a recognised song. Although many primitive songs have undoubtedly arisen in this way, the theory of imitation, considered as an explanation of the origin of music, is somewhat in discredit with ethnologists and philosophers. It is much too partial, and there are too many cases to which it certainly cannot apply. In his study, Arbeit und Rhythmus, Karl Bücher advances the idea that through regular work of any kind, song as an accompaniment is naturally induced. The regularity of the work, be it walking, driving a stake, or grinding corn in a hollowed-out stone, supplies one element of music, i.e. rhythm. One element of a tune being present, what more natural than an attempt on the part of the worker to supply the other element and thus lighten the labour? Especially is this likely to happen if the task requires several workers, who are obliged to work together somewhat in unison. Boucher says, Song is the offspring of labour. It is a means employed to discipline individual activities to the accomplishment of a common task. Leaving out of consideration, however, all external stimuli which may or may not have had a determinative influence in the development of primitive music, we cannot but think of the remark of Karl Berkel, which strikes the note of truth. Song has its origin in the cry of joy or sorrow, in the need of expression inborn in all peoples in a state of nature. From the foregoing, it is easily to be seen that the first music was vocal. Vocal music has its origin and cause in the elemental urge of nature, whereas musical instruments, even of the most primitive description, are a subsequent development and spring from the inventive faculty of man. The most elemental cries of primitive peoples consist of a succession of sounds beginning on a high tone and descending by means of a gliding or slurring effect to a low tone. Such are the cries of the Caribs and of the Aboriginal inhabitants of Australia. Sometimes the gliding of the voice takes an upward turn, as it is said to do among the Polynesian cannibals when gloating over a victim about to be sacrificed. Definite musical tones cannot be recognised in these primitive cries, hence they cannot be accurately written down in the musical notation of civilization. In such simple and elemental cries as these, although no definite musical intervals are to be recognised, it is not long before they appear. 
In fact, it is easily to be seen in the most primitive music that the production of definite tones, and more or less of a definite melodic design, is the object toward which the savage mind unconsciously gropes. It must not be supposed that the intervals in use in civilised music are wholly the invention of man. Many of the intervals, such as thirds, fifths, and octaves, are found to be quite perfect in certain animal cries, and particularly in birdsong. Consider the two following birdsongs collected by the writer in Massachusetts. Civilised man has arranged these tones and intervals in diatonic sequences, called scales. The scales are his invention, but the majority of the intervals composing them were undoubtedly in frequent use by primitive man from prehistoric times. As Gilman truly observes, definite successions of tones were in use long before they became regular systematic scales. The following cry of grief from the southeastern coast of Africa illustrates both the falling inflection of the voice already alluded to as a primitive characteristic and also the use of definite musical intervals. It was noted by Henri A. Junod. Here is another lament, this one being from New Zealand. The tonal range is somewhat more extensive, but the falling inflection of the voice is well illustrated. The usual savage downward howl occurs at the end. In the Narrative of the United States Exploring Expedition, by Captain Wilkes, the following song is noted. It comes from the island of Arnheim in Polynesia. The most primitive musical utterances are usually confined to a narrow range. Seconds and thirds are the intervals most frequently used. The songs of the Tierra del Fuegians, for example, do not usually exceed the limits of a third. The song just quoted from Arnheim is, it will be noted, with the exception of the ornamental quirks, confined to the range of a second. The most limited songs in regard to range of intervals, however, appear to be the songs of the Andamanese Islanders. M. V. Portman, in a paper on Andamanese music, published in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, says, The only notes in use in their songs are the following, and in this order. The leading note, one quarter sharp. The tonic, the tonic one quarter sharp. The whole range of notes is therefore not equal to a superfluous second. The savage mind, being incapable for the most part of the development of a musical idea, is satisfied by an incessant repetition of the same phrases. Here is a song of the Caribs, as noted by Théodore de Brie. While it is comprised within the interval of a small second, it was repeated sometimes for an hour at a time with what monotonous effect we can well imagine. Another Carib song, comprised within the interval of a fourth, is here given. A similar song from Polynesia is also given for purposes of comparison. The two songs are remarkably similar, in fact almost identical. The geographical separation of the Caribs and the Polynesians is so great as to have made intercommunication almost beyond the bounds of possibility. How then can the similarity be accounted for? Apparently only by assuming that peoples who live in similar conditions and whose minds are in a similar state of development, may express themselves in a similar manner. 
Carib example. Polynesian example. Germs of the principle of contrast may be found in both the above songs. A second phrase or musical motive has been invented which is sung alternatively with the first, thereby relieving the sense of monotony. This was certainly a great step in the development of primitive music. The invention of a second musical phrase, and the contrasting of it with the first, was the unconscious beginning of musical form. For contrast is the basic principle of form in music. The following song from Samoa shows this principle of the contrasting of musical motives very clearly. The two motives are sung by different groups of persons. The above, the tune you just heard, is a tune in which the contrasting phrases are of equal length and recur with great regularity, but many tunes are found in which the contrasting motives, or melodic particles, follow each other with whimsical irregularity, their relative position and recurrence following no law but the feeling of the singer at the moment. Such is this tune of the Makushi Indians of South America. But this Eskimo tune, noted by Dr. Kane, one of the earliest Arctic explorers, while the motives follow each other with regularity and are of equal length, each motive is given twice before the contrasting motive occurs. Two little tunes from Africa may serve as final illustrations of this contrasting phrase principle. These tunes are also interesting inasmuch as both contain a germ of ragtime. The sources of ragtime are to be found in the songs of the American Negro slaves, and it is significant to find these hints also present in the songs of the parent African race. Dance Song
hunting song. Both the above are taken from Up the Niger by Captain A. F. Mockler Ferryman. End of section two.